Could we go to the um, 155 on the theme of uh, overlapping issues and benefits to the claimants from the 155? And it's in Dundle uh, F, divider 16, page 864. And just two points on this substantial document. All the substantial bulk of it, of course, covers the nature of the damage. So that, sorry, I was being slow. Where, where, where have we got to? Uh, we're bundle F, my lord. Uh, supplementary bundle F, the 155, which is in divider 16, page 86, and I'm going to page 864. I was just describing all the previous paragraphs, which uh, go into great detail about the nature of the damage and loss. This is the um, 155 statement of claim. It is. Yep. And just one point to touch on here before we look at the relief, and it's at the bottom of page 864 on the screen at the moment, and as you can see, the public prosecutor, under guidelines for emergency measures, is taking the position uh, above socio-economic programmes. The themes of the programmes, that's the TTAC programmes, show a reasonable way of action to be developed, provided it's understood as a minimum guarantee of protection. And then. 155 identifies the various themes, and those are the TTAC Renova themes, starting with the survey and registration program of the impacted, reimbursement and compensation of the, uh, of the impacted. And that serves to explain to some extent why the judge in the 155 has been uh, taking steps to improve the um, TTAC themes and the Renova programs built on them. So one then goes to the relief that is claimed, and that's at page 886, and it starts, in fact, a little earlier at um, 883, where headed requests on, on, on page 883, and the, the requests are divided into interlocutory relief, uh, starting on 883. And then we go in a moment to the final relief. But as part of the interlocutory relief, as you can see from page 886, under the heading preparation and uh, approval management performance and so on, you see the defendant companies on a jointly and several basis and so on have to A, submit a socio-environmental recovery mitigation and compensation plan, the socio-environmental plan, and B, the bottom of that paragraph, submit a socio-economic recovery, mitigation, compensation and indemnification plan. Uh, and that obligation is then picked up in the final relief. On page 901. And that I... Uh, is reflected in the words at the beginning of definitely, which means final relief on page 901. The Federal Prosecutor's Office reiterated all the preliminary hearing pleads. That, mean, that means we're seeking final relief in respect of those that were pleaded as interlocutory relief. And then you see one, and I just ask you to note this because this is relevant to the nature and scope of the findings that will be made in the 155. The defendants are jointly convicted to fully repair the social and environmental damages caused by the dam's collapse as specified in the relevant plans, ensuring to the public entities the benefit and so on, A, restoration of the entire area, B, a few lines further down, restoration of the entire impacted flora, vegetation, C, restructuring of permanent preservation, a few lines further down on the right-hand side, restructuring of the Atlantic forest bioma and so on, and then E, four lines up from the bottom, restoration of the ecological properties related to the quality of the river's water and of the estuary, and so on. So that is the final relief sought in respect of the in-kind relief. Um, you then go to Roman numeral 5 at the bottom of 902, and that contains the request for a generic sentence in respect of the socio-economic and human damages suffered by all the individuals and groups which I think you've been taken to. And so, just, sorry, where were we? 90. That's page 902, Roman numeral 5 at the bottom. I don't think we were taken to 
eventually. Oh, I'm sorry, that's the. Uh, well, maybe I didn't mark. Maybe you'll I see three lines down from the top. Failed to mark it. Yeah. By means of a generic sentence. It's, which acknowledges the existence of an obligation to repair the moral and property damages and so on. And then just to note over the page on 903 at Roman numeral 10. Just, just give me one moment. Three, five. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, Roman numeral 10 over the page on 903, second paragraph up from the bottom. The defendant company shall be jointly convicted to reimburse the public expense and then look at B of all public entities. So that is a claim on behalf of the municipalities in respect of their additional expenditure caused by the collapse, which is duplicated in the MPOC. So that, that is the, the 155, and we've looked at the MPOC. Um, a, a few short points relevant to overlap, uh, which, which I'll, I'll develop uh, when I move into the uh, dealing with the claimant's criticisms. But first of all, as you can see, it follows from the relief claims that improvements to Renova, including its indemnity schemes are one potential outcome, whether by settlement or judicial determination. And that is not disputed. And if I can just give you the reference, it's Rosa 1, paragraph 512, supplementary bundle K, tab 35, page 2198, where he accepts that the court may have to determine the precise scope of particular programs which cannot be agreed and in particular, what changes it is necessary to make to any programmes established under the TTAC. And then he says, to ensure that they result in full indemnification of the damage caused by the collapse as required under Brazilian law. So that's Rosa's um, position in relation to the potential outcome of the, um, of the 155. And it's, that is also in the evidence of Mr. Vivan in Vivan 1, supplementary I stroke 29, 1489, and Vivan 2 at supplementary M stroke 41, 27740. But indemnification can't there mean compensation, can it? We're talking about it does. Remed remedial programs. No, that indemnification means compensation. Well, how can you do that through a socio economic program? Because one of them is. Um, the, the yes. PIM, is, PIM is one of the programmes. Yes, I think you showed us that, um, in fact, just when we were looking at the, at the claim, yes. that rather oddly, the socio-economic programme includes individual compensation. Yes, yes, yes. I see. And, and PIM is one of those programmes. Yes, it is. Yes. Yes. So I'll come in the, in the TTAC as well. So yes, I'll, I'll come to that. Um, so the, that's that point. Um, The second point is, as you've seen, the CPA contains several heads of relief from which all the appellants can benefit, including the 58, who cannot benefit from the generic sentence. And you saw, for example, the municipalities can benefit from final relief for Roman numeral 10 that I took you to. Yeah, the municipalities, though, it's the 13 who are the real crunch from your yes, point I'll, of view. I'll, yeah, and the municipalities I'll, are not part of the 13. No, they're not. They're, they're the 19. Um, and that's only reimbursement. Twenty-five. So, uh, and that's only reimbursement of expenses, not all the claims of the municipality. It's not everything they're bringing, but they're also bringing tax claims, which may have dicey rule three issues. But that's another point. Um, but therefore, all the claimants can potentially benefit from the in-kind relief, and I don't think that's disputed because clearly, cleaning the river and removing tailings and so on benefits the claimants. And Mr. Vivan. You want to reference at uh, Vivan 1, paragraph 184 and following. There's no need to go to it. Um, but he, that's a supplementary I-291488. He summarises the overlap in relief sought in the 155 and the claims made in England. Um, 
So, for example, there is restoration of churches is claimed, and the Archdiocese of Mariana is bringing claims in England in respect of damaged churches. So there's, that's a, one example of the sort of overlap there is. And there's a general level of agreement in relation to this. Professor Rosa... Sorry, can we just be clear about this? The overlap is of the kind we discussed just before lunch. In the UK proceedings, they're seeking monetary relief for damage. And you are saying that under the CPA, the damage will be repaired. Yes. And therefore, if it's completely repaired, yes. subject to any loss of income point, yes. there, you, there will be no damage. Yes. And this is relevant generally yeah, to some of the problems. Yeah, OK, but it's that kind of overlap. It's that not, kind of overlap yeah. I'm not on at the moment, in terms of relief. And then Professor Rosa, Rosa and as I know you, you, you've got the rest of the references, so i perhaps just give you paragraph 373. He says, some of the claimants are likely to derive benefit from the works which have been carried out, are currently being carried out, or may be carried out. So it just... Uh, we, we then go to overlapping causation and damages issues. And again, I'll, I'll deal with this relatively briefly with some, some references, if I may. But uh, you'll have in mind the judge identified, he did describe in quite strong terms that there was likely to be a large number of overlapping issues. Uh, Vivan 1 at paragraphs 204 to 211, supplementary I, divider 29, 1495. In those paragraphs, he identifies the issues that arise in the 155, for example, from paragraph 206. And he shows how those issues also overlap with the English claims. Um, and Professor Rosa, just to see what he says, uh, he makes two relevant points, which in my submission suggests he recognises the reality that such issues will arise in the 155. First, he recognised in paragraph 193 of his report that in CPAs relating to environmental disasters, expert evidence is usually especially important. And this is obviously correct, and it's what's happening at the moment and has been happening in the 155. Experts have been appointed in it and in the PAs, and I'll come to that, they're producing reports on these issues. Second, he states, some questions such as those mentioned by Mr. Devan would no doubt be the subject of evidence before the 12th Federal Court, and that is at paragraph 382 of Rosa 1. So there's common ground that evidence on those overlapping issues will be before the 12th Federal Court in the 155. The fundamental criticism or debate on this issue between Rosa and Professor <coughs> Didier and Mr. Devan is that despite making those points, there is perhaps, to some extent, an issue as to whether the court in the 155 will make factual findings in relation to damage and causation, which would be binding in subsequent proceedings in Brazil, and this is linked to my Lord, Lord Justice Popperwell's point um, earlier this morning. And in fact, may I just make three points? The submission being that the practical reality is that in the 155, causation and damage issues are in fact already under expert and judicial consideration. And this builds into the submission that there will be duplication and waste, therefore, if the MPOC proceeds to seek to determine the same issues. And the first point is, it's what is common ground, and I mentioned this this morning without giving a reference, that the court in the 155 would decide such issues as are necessary for the purposes of deciding whether to grant a particular request for relief. That's verbatim Rosa at paragraph 382. So the court would not make findings on any issues except so far as necessary for the purposes of deciding whether to grant a particular request for relief. Second, as is again common ground, the 155 contains a large number of requests for in-kind relief. Do you, do you say that means that he's accepting that it will decide all relevant causation issues? 
he, he's accepting that the court will decide causation and damage issues if, using his language, they are necessary for the purposes of deciding whether to grant a particular request for relief. Well, if, if indemnification means compensation, that would, and that's to be given the effect you, says it, you say it's to be given, uh, it would mean that in the CPA <coughs> they'd be deciding individual compensation, which everybody agrees in this area. I, I accept that in this regard he's not referring to indemnification or compensation. My <coughs> point is that it's damages and causation well, issues. Why, well, the request why, why do you extend it to causation? Then? Because, as Professor Didier explains, for example, the request for restoration of the entire area impacted by the deposition and flow by of tailings will require... I know that's what Professor Didier... But I, I, I think you were concerned at the moment to try and persuade us there wasn't really an issue between the experts, or at least not one... Not, uh, not, which, not which we should treat as as no. uh, as, as, as uh, dissuading us from finding that the issues of causation were indeed going to be decided in the CPA. Yes. And I was only questioning whether that reference you've given us to Rosa at 382 can really bear the interpretation you put upon it as well, accepting that causation will be. Dealt well, with. the the reason I I. I went to Didier 2, paragraph 258, is, is, is not, not to highlight a difference, but all, all that Didier 2 is doing at that point is to demonstrate that it's obvious from the terms of the requests that findings of causation and damage will have to be made so they fit in with the wording, except in so far as necessary. But is, 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 this, is this the explanation? It may not be that some of the things requested in the, in the 155 CPA uh, give rise to immediate legal obligations, such as an order that you rebuild a particular uh, church or that you uh, purify the water quality in such and such a tributary or take the tail, and so on. Yes. But those are all, those are none of them individual claims. No. So far as the individual claims are concerned, the relief sought is not the payment of individual damages, but the setting up of a PIM-type scheme which yes. will result in individual damages for those who are who are yes. able to who are willing to accept the offer made. Yes. Yes. So that causation may require some big picture causation questions, such as did tailings infect the so and so tributary? Yes. Uh, will have to be considered as part of the 155 seats. Yes. But uh, whether uh, a particular individual suffered ill health as a result of exposure won't. No. Is that, is that the, That's the my point, uh, in a sense. I, in, I'm building on what Lord Justice Popperwell said. Just as in an English group action, therefore, in the 155 there will be the type of generic issue findings that you have uh, suggested. And those findings can then be deployed and relied upon in individual proceedings. And, and, and furthermore, there is duplication and waste because these are exactly the same sort of findings that would be required to be made in the English proceedings. But I wonder whether there's an elision in your uh, argument. I, I understand you saying uh, if in the 155 CPA the, uh, there is going to be granted relief as to what is to be done by way of remedy yes. of, uh, in relation to forests or whatever. Uh, that may require determining whether uh, or to what extent the flood has caused the damage that, yes. that is said to be remedied and so on. That's the point. That, that, that would all be something to be determined uh, in futuro. Uh, it, in relation to individual claims for compensation, there may be questions of causation as to losses which have been being suffered for the last seven years, uh, which can no longer be uh, investigated or are no longer going to be investigated for the purposes of future in-species remediation. Uh, I imagine it's rained quite a lot in the last seven years, and water quality now uh, may require some form of remediation, but that won't that won't necessarily tell you what the water quality was over the three years after the flood for the citizens of <coughs> Governor Valadores, all of whose claims may, or 
many of whose claims may raise that as a common issue. Uh, uh, that's why I say the devil may be in the detail. I, I well, understand I, your generic point yes. that there may be some causation I don't issues want to... which have to be decided for what I've been calling remediation. Yes. But known no constat that uh, there w will not be other common causation issues to individual people's claims, which will not be. I, I accept that. And, and I accept the general point that individual causation issues, just, I would argue, in, as in England, would have to be determined in liquidation proceedings. But I don't just mean individual one-off causation issues. I mean causation issues which might, in a GLO in England, be common to all 132,000 citizens of Governor or well, Dara's and be suitable for all the benefits that group litigation can offer in managing that particular issue. Well, I may have to come back to that, my lord, because I, I, I do... This is also part of my general submission. We're going to give you the references. But I, I, the aims and objectives of a CPO at the generic level, so far as I can see, are very similar, if not identical, to the aims and objectives of a GLO in English proceedings. And how effective an English GLO is in dealing with the types of individual or group-ish, small group issues, is always going to be a function of how homogenous the group is. And in my submission, this is a uniquely diverse, vast and diverse group. I'm sure you're going to come to this, but yes. I keep just having a block on the fact that the fact of the matter is nothing's happening in the CPA. There's a dispute as to whether it's stayed. It's certainly not going anywhere at the moment. And there's an expert dispute as to whether or not there will ever be any findings in the CPA well, at all. The, the, the question of whether there will be a trial, Mr. Palladano will deal with me at Article 80 in the Article 4. I understand, Article but, but and is, I, isn't it relevant it. to this as well? Well, it, it, that, that point is, is, is relevant to this, to, 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 to the... Directly um, relevant, over, because over. looking at overlap and all the rest of it may be all very interesting, but if there's a real chance of none of this ever happening in Brazil because of the negotiated route and the PAs and the... LCPs and what have you, then this is all academic. Well, in my submission, it's not because one of the potential outcomes is a trial in which these matters will be. But the, in answer to your point, will be determined. In answer to your point, nothing's happening. It's relevant to that as well because, as I'll come to, all of these expert issues are being investigated. Expert work has been carrying on uh, throughout this period, and indeed. When I give you the update, I will be able to tell you the happy news that a large number of reports have been produced and considerable progress has been made. And indeed, it's as a result of the expert work, for example, that Judge Mario was able to make his determinations in the novel system. But we need to remember the burden of proof. It's not a question of you saying that there is a real possibility of a trial. You need to show that there's no, po no realistic possibility of there not being a trial. Well, the, 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 at this stage, my... Uh, Demonstrating overlapping issues, I appreciate, um, on, on one version, uh, doesn't assist me in relation to the burdens and disadvantages if there's not going to be a trial. But it is part of the problems that the judge identified. But I'm equally on the point that the 155 is and has been materially progressing and benefiting the claimant's claims, because through the 155, the various procedural and other initiatives have resulted in improvements and continue to result in improvements in the indemnity schemes and improvements in Renova, which in turn means improvements in Axis 7, which is the indemnity scheme, the systemic improvements. And so that is vital to the abuse and the pointfulness and my, the, my point earlier, that through the 155 and these procedural mechanisms, systemic improvements have been and are being made, and, 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 I'll, and I'll come to that. So my third point was, in fact, that there's no dispute that experts have been appointed in the 155. It's common ground, and, and you heard what Professor Rosa said about that, and it's, it's common ground that they have been continuing with their work and sorry, what sort of experts are we talking well, about? Well, uh, uh, yes, well, there are three, uh, and they are as Rambol, which is an expert that was appointed precisely to improve Renova, help improve Renova and its programs. So, there is an expert 
in the 155, Ramble, who is dealing with and has been dealing with and reporting in relation to criticisms about all aspects of Renova. Secondly, there's an expert, FGF. That, that, that may not help us very much if Ramble has been critical of what Renova has done. Well, I, that, that, that is part of my general point, that yes, there are criticisms, but the important point is they are, uh, Renova is subject to court supervision and there are mechanisms to ensure that those such criticisms there, there are, are being met. But to answer your Lordship's question, there's also an expert who is charged with considering the socio-economic programmes, which also includes the indemnification and considering those, and there's an expert charged with considering and, and reporting in relation to the socio-environmental programmes. And their work has been continuing, and I'll, and I'll update you in relation to that. So, I, if I could just turn to the GTAC. But these are not experts in, in the sense of those who might address issues of, of, of causation or liability. In a, in a yes, way. potentially. Yeah, yes. Oh, well. It doesn't sound like it. It didn't sound like it. It didn't it. sound like it. Um, I, I must say, well, the reason I asked rather abruptly what experts is I was wondering whether what you were saying was that there were, as it were, court appointed experts or Renova appointed experts saying, uh, looking into the issues of uh, contamination of this or that stretch of the river with tailings and what the effect was. But that wasn't the point you were making. And even if there were, their decisions might well feed into what remedial work was then done. But they wouldn't be determinative of any legal issue, or at best they would be evidence if there were ever any hearing. Well, so I, they don't really advance the argument. Well, they? I have two points. One is they are an example of steps being taken in the 155 from which the claimants have benefited. Because this work is benefiting the class of whom the claimants are, are one. Um, they are the prosecutor's experts. So they're the experts that, that the prosecutor considers are necessary in order to further the objectives of the 155. And therefore, it's under that auspices that they have appointed experts of the type that I have identified, and, and establishing the net, using expert evidence to establish the nature and extent of the damage, as you might expect, has been a key driver. Yes. No, I expect it would, but and also using experts in order to appraise the effectiveness of Renova uh, has been important, and indeed recently, as part of a priority access, for example, Judge Mario has appointed an expert in order to look at Renova's governance further. And I'll come to that. So, but could I update you on the experts when I just get to the yes, sorry, yes, sorry. five? So just dealing with the with the GTAC. Um, the GTAC was entered into on the 25th of June, 200, uh, 2018. It's ratified on the 8th of August, 2018. The parties to the GTAC are the Federal Public Prosecutor, the State Public Prosecutors of Minas Gerais and Espiritu Santo, the Federal Public Defender's Office, the State Public Defender's Office from the main states, the Federal Government, the Governments of Minas Gerais and Espiritu Santo, several other government agencies, the companies and Renova. And there are three key points relevant to the... Sorry, the companies being... The three Brazilian companies. The three sorry. Brazilian companies? Three Brazilian yes, companies. sorry, the three Brazilian yeah. And just to build it, these points are made briefly at paragraph 39 of our skeleton. The first point is the commitment to full redress. The GTAC built on the TTAC and acknowledged the continuing commitment of the companies to make full redress to those affected through the Renova mechanism. The second point is it provided for certain changes to Renova's governance and provided for ratification of the role and function of Renova. So Renova has been approved by all those parties, including the federal prosecutor on behalf of the claimants, and the 12th federal court. The third key point... As a mechanism. As the as mechanism, as, a, as, as, the, as, as the, the function, its function has been approved, its role and function. And the third key point 
is that it provided for a formal negotiation process to improve Renova's programmes, and that's all the programmes, including the indemnity compensation programme, for an extendable two-year period with the participation of, amongst others, the prosecutors and defenders. And this is the crucial point I'd respectfully like to underline. The principles which would govern the renegotiation process and the resolution of the 155 include full redress of the damages caused. So it follows from these key points that all important bodies representing the interests of affected persons in Brazil agreed in the GTAC that Renova was the appropriate mechanism to provide full redress, agreed that the negotiation was the appropriate way forward in order to secure full redress, with the option of court resolution if an agreement or full agreement could not be reached, and agreed that court resolution of any such issues would be on the basis of full redress. There is no dispute between the experts on any of the matters I've just outlined, and the references to Rose's evidence, if I could just give the paragraphs of his report, they are paragraphs on the role of Renova being ratified, paragraphs 427 and 480, and on negotiations and the resolution of the 155 on the basis of full redress are paragraphs 444, 462, 463, and 464. But the matters being referred to court are, as we debated earlier this week, are um, thing, disputes over a mediated, an appropriate mediated outcome. Well, Mr. Toledano will address you further on that. In, in our submission, matters that are referred to court pursuant to sections 99 and 103, um, which you were taken to, are any, are any disagreements, any issues that arise, are still outstanding or arise between the parties? Well, the, 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 the experts disagree on that then, because Rose is very clear that what gets referred back to court, he says, are simply matters that are not agreed through the negotiation process as opposed to um, full-on litigation. Well, we, we support the judge's finding in that regard and uh, I, I, your, your ladyship identifies the disagreement and Mr Toledano will address you further on that. Um, so, at one and the same time, it's Professor Rosa who is, in, in different parts of his report, questioning the obligation to to provide full redress in, in, in court, but that's another, that's another issue. So I now turn to Renova. And may I just start... And I'm sorry, but again, you've referred to Rosa, when I go to these paragraphs, will I find the other paragraphs where Rosa says, it was all agreed, but that is... Well, there's lots of evidence, isn't there, along the lines of, by this stage, Renova, the very extraordinary, so it said, interposition of Renova between claimants and the Brazilian companies was effectively, it was almost too late in GTAC to go back on that structure and that the MPF went along with it for reasons of expediency and best in all circumstances. He did say that and that is also addressed by Professor Didier and Professor Rezek but with the grace of respect when the public prosecutor, all the public defenders, the federal government, the state governments and all those interested parties and stakeholders take the line that they do, I think one can fairly say that they have done so in the best interests of the affected parties. And as, as I took you to in the 155, they say this is the minimal, this is, this is the starting point, and they, they recognise that it was a sensible basis for improving matters, a starting point for improving matters. But that is the ratification, it is ratified by the court, it wasn't appealed, And that is how the parties have proceeded, on that basis of full redress. And there's no dispute about that, and that is obviously in the claimant's interest. Full redress is in all negotiations, full redress for all, um, if there are any disputes. And, and it follows from that, that if, for example, complaints were being made by claimants, local commissions, the public prosecutor, about the quality of PIM general, that would be addressed through the mechanism of the 155 or Priority Axis 7. So there is a court-supervised mechanism, a 
approved of and chosen by the claimant's own representatives, their privy representatives, for improving as, as appropriate, for example, PIM General, the novel system being a different, an entirely different scheme. So as far as Renova is concerned, um, and may, may I just make four overarching points which one sees reflected in the judge's findings in paragraph 134 is the first factor is the inevitable complexity of any scheme dealing with damage on this scale and, and it's fair to say that there will always be a great number of challenges when assessing and quantifying hundreds of thousands of individual claims and therefore always be scope for dissatisfaction and complaints I make no criticism of those complaining. A second factor is that Renova was the product of collaboration, consensus, and ongoing improvement. As I've shown you, key stakeholders were involved in its creation and its ratification. They've all agreed in the GTAC that it's an appropriate vehicle for making full redress in accordance with Brazilian law. They've agreed that it should be supervised and improved through the 155 and that was the preferred option, as the judge noted in paragraph 134. Third, within its governance, Renova has to deal with a diverse range of stakeholders. And in its redress, it has to help a diverse range of victims. And that poses, I accept, inevitable challenges. And fourth, a point that I made this morning, one can take into account the value the claimants themselves place on Renova. Just over half of them, nearly 100,000, have accepted payments. And it is and remains their position in the pleaded paragraph I took you to, 257, I think, <coughs> that they must continue to have access to Renova whilst these proceedings are ongoing. And indeed, as I've also told you, and I'll give you the reference, the appellant solicitors wrote on the 15th of November 2018 and that's at Opus B3 stroke 39 stroke 1, saying, we trust also that Renova will continue to honour its legal obligations, including the provision of financial assistance while the litigation is ongoing. And that remains the position. I've taken you to paragraphs 132, um, which we, we, a finding which we rely on, Paragraph 134 is where the judge dealt with um, Renova, and that's para page 251 of the... the... Sorry, the fact 132, I know we're going back, is the finding is that there is no recorded case of Renova ever having refused, not the other stuff, and no, no, never denied legal liability. That, those are the findings. That, 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 those are the findings. All the findings I rely on in 152, yes. 132, 132 yes. yes. Okay. And then... I also rely on the findings in, in, in 134, which is where the judge... Those aren't the same quality of findings. Well, what the judge is... He says, nevertheless, the following points can be made, and if there's... We rely on in our response notice as findings if, if that is an issue. But in, in my submission, it is, of course material that in one reads 132, which I've taken you to, with 1347 on page 252, where he says, there is some dispute as to whether the categories of claim falling within the scope of the Renova program are broad enough to cover every single potential category of legitimate claim arising out of the dam failure. However, I'm satisfied in the absence of compelling and concrete examples that any such discrepancy is more apparent than real, and in any event, any claimant dissatisfied with an offer made by Renova is free to pursue her remedy for full redress in the courts. So one reads that finding with the finding in 132. One then has the other findings in 134, and where he, in 1341, refers to the fact that the public prosecutor has decided to 
uh, use Renova as the uh, as, uh, as, uh, in order to provide the full redress as the mechanism for providing full redress. He makes that point in one. He then deals with the vast scale of the undertaking in two. He then deals with my lady's point in three. Mm -hmm. Complaint is made that it's effectively controlled, and he says, nevertheless, it demonstrates the degree of uh, internal governance comprising of different bodies. There may be room for argument, but the right where the right balance should lie. But it is apparent that a number of public and independent stakeholders now have a significant role to play in the guiding the work of the foundation. He then identifies a problem that any scheme would face of having to deal with dis disputed issues, possibly fraudulent claims, which there is evidence about, and the fact that a balance has to be struck. He refers to the fact that Renova in six has sought to achieve the balance by applying a damage matrix, the application of which is intended to provide consistency and manageability. He's drawing on the evidence of Mr. De Freitas here in particular. And as he says, the claimants do not appear to challenge the suggestion, and there is no challenge to this, right, at least conceptually, that this is an appropriate mechanism to deploy in order to set about the calculation of quantum of loss, although they do make specific criticisms of the length of the forms, the scope of the categories, and the adequacy of the figures. Then he goes on and makes his findings he does. So we, we respectfully rely on those findings. And for the purposes of my abuse application, uh, it, it is sufficient in my submission for my purposes that G Renova, in a, coupled with the findings in 132, is the subject of judicial scrutiny and improvement through the following avenues. The 155, the PAs, including PA7 in particular, which is the indemnity priority axis, and in the local commission claims. So the short point is that the Brazilian justice system has mechanisms through which systemic problems have been and are being addressed. And insofar as they're not, this is not a mandatory scheme. You can always go to, to the local court, which I have to turn to. And as, forgive me for, 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 for repeating that. But so far as getting a handle on the evidence in relation to Renova, I think the best way to, to do that, and I hope this will assist you, is just to show you what, how we covered these topics, because they, and, and, and it's referenced, and we can give you the references. I didn't put De Freitas in the bundle out of a misguided attempt to limit the number of documents in the bundle, which I now, I now regret, but we will put it in the De Freitas 1 and De Freitas 2 in the ongoing bundle. But the relevant De Freitas witnesses, uh, uh, references are in this section of the Turner Skeleton, which is at bundle C, divider 4, page 89. And I needn't dwell on these points. And going back to 132, 134, they're not findings of fact in the sense that um, these deciding between competing arguments. He's making, he's saying what the documents, if there is or isn't a record of something, and then he's making comments. He's not making findings of fact. Well, I, I, I would su su submit that they are, what he's, what he's doing is making findings in respect of matters that are unchallenged. They're common ground, and they're not challenged on this appeal. There is no challenge to well, 132 and 133 and 1347. The claimant <coughs> could have appealed those particular matters. They, 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 their findings in relation to matters, I, I respectfully submit, which are, which are not disputed. I wonder if they're more disputable. reasons than reasoning than Part of findings. the evaluation, yes. Mm -hmm. so part, they're, they're part of his evaluative findings. Um, and he's doing exactly what the claimants would like to criticise him for, or not doing exactly what the claimants would like to criticise him for, namely embarking on a mini-trial. He's looking all the time and finding in his evaluative exercise matters that are really not disputable. So if you could just look at, look at this, because I think it, it'll, it'll assist you to put some flesh on paragraph 134. But you can see that at paragraph 257 it starts, the 
position in relation to funding is set out, and there's really never been any suggestion on the evidence that funding or lack of it has ever ex affected the provision of redress, but in, and that's not surprising, as is explained later at 269, and the references there given, because the bu Renova budget has exceeded the amounts required by the TTAC every year, and that has never been uh, an issue. The structure and governance points are made at 262 and 263 on page 1991, and you'll see, just pausing on one of them, that the key independent body which is uh, carries out a number of important functions including guiding Renova's priorities and so on as listed at 264A is the Interfederative Committee which is an entirely independent body independent auditors you then get at 14.3 the involvement of affected people the argument at 14.3 uh, sorry it's, it's paragraph 266 Oh, sorry, yes. My, my mistake. No, no, my, no, my fault. I um, um, noticed those headings. 267, we, we then deal with, based on the, the Freitas and the expert evidence, the, the allegations about independence, and one, one can see really why they're unfair. Um, the way the budget is prepared by bottom up, as it were, and then we deal with its re activities at 270, reparatory work at 271 and compensatory work, and reparatory work is uncapped. And then we turn to the PIM programme and explain how uh, Renova seeks to deliver full redress through its programmes. And rather than pausing there, could I just commend to you, given the amount of paper there is, Annex 5, which is at page 233 of the bundle, where we summarise the, the programmes, and on page 233, you see PIM Water, that stayed open until December 2017, and about 264,000 individuals accepted settlements. Um, then you get PIM General uh, on page 234, and, um, and, and what's, if I may say so, Given, given some of the court's comments, I, I do respectfully ask you to take note of the care and attention given to designing it and to its operation. That's dealt with by Mr. Fallick, who is an independent mediator specialising, it's referred to at paragraph 10, in the design, implementation and management of dispute resolution systems. He assisted in designing the PIM general programme. He says something about, or some of the quotes from his statement are referred to. And, it, and it's exactly what you would expect if one was setting up a, a programme from scratch here. At 11, you see that independent mediators and Renova staff all receive training. You then get the actual procedure, which in, involves a series of meetings at which the um, applicant will be accompanied by a lawyer or other trusted person. Information and evidence is given, and either the applicant, and this I submit as important, can seek to prove whatever their loss is, so they're in exactly the same position as they would be in a court, and they're being assisted by mediators. If they don't, if they have difficulties in that regard, they can take advantage of the, uh, the, the damages matrix, and that's addressed um, after PIM settle, general settlement offers at paragraph 23, at paragraphs 24 and following, and again, you see the extent to which the damage matrix 25 was developed through collective dialogue meetings with impacted communities. Monetary values for items were based on market research, this is 27, and technical studies. And all of the values put in the matrix were then approved by various independent bodies, including the IFC. So great care was taken to try and ensure that the process was fair. But if you don't want to, you can seek to prove your loss, as I keep saying. And then, again, to try and assist those who still, in certain informal economic activities, who have difficulty, you see the three indemnification policies referred to on page 240. At paragraph 30, Renova developed the indemnification policies out of recognition that it may be difficult for people engaged in certain informal activities whose involvement in that activity was impacted to prove 
that they carried on this activity and of the losses they've therefore suffered. And that included sand miners, tourism entrepreneurs, and fishermen. And they have special indemnification policies, all agreed in terms of the indemnification figures and types of proof with the fishing sector. So that's just to, to give, give your lordships and my lady some idea of, 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 of what is involved and was involved in the design of, um, uh, of, of PIM. And if, just to give you some ideas of how... Does this state the position... We, we, we told that perhaps particularly after the Baisho Grindau judgment, but possibly also before, uh, there have been improvements. Yes. This is, this is obviously a forensic document. At what date is it stating the position? This, this is stating the position um, as at the date of the evidence that... The uh, most recent evidence. It's so, the re recent evidence. So it? incorporating changes made up to the trial following the Baisho Grundau no, judgment. No, no. But, but it wouldn't incorporate the changes following the Baisho Grandu judgment but because that very, that's a different scheme. The PIM scheme well, was carried on. Well, uh, I suppose that's right. I had, my recollection was that... It's yes, I'm confusing myself. You're quite right. He, he. Well, but is that possibly a difficulty for you? That the criticisms of the PIM streams, as they stood in July 2020 or shortly before, when he was hearing the evidence about it, are the very uh, the very ones which made him say the system is unworkable for a lot of the people it's intended to help, and therefore I need to develop my new scheme. Yes, I, I accept that um, Judge Mario was critical of what he described as the slowness and bureaucracy of Renova. But and those criticisms are made essentially of the state of affairs that you're describing in this document. Yes. Um, the, 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 those are criticisms of the slowness and bureaucracy, not necessarily of the nature of the matrix and the uh, of all the factors that I have um, that I've identified. But my key point is that it is an iterative process. It is not part of my case that Renova started off perfect. It clearly didn't, which is why the 155 sought to take Renova as the starting point, its programs as the starting point. My point is that there is in a, the Brazilian justice system, including those representing the claimants, since the initiation of the 155, has been using the justice system in order to improve Renova. And that is why, for example, as I said a moment ago, Judge Mario has recently um, in, uh, instituted a further priority access that deals with Renova. It's why they identified priority access seven, because it was recognized that the indemnity scheme needed to be improved. So that is my submission. It, 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 it has been subject to improvement, and, the, and certainly coming from that is the point that the judge charged with that has not only been seeking to improve PIM, he has said claimants must now have, and you've seen that section of the Baichu Guandu judgment, three different routes to redress, and he sets them out, and he says they're separate, and they operate differently. And they are, one, the courts, two, PIM, which he continues to, as it were, recognise should be used, and three, his new novel scheme. So these are all routes open to all of the claimants, except for the 58, for whom the court route is, is open, as I've said, in the moment of denial of liability. So, and wh while we're, we're on the... Um, you will, I'll come back to this if I, if, if, if I may, but it, while we're in the Turner skeleton, could I just take you to paragraph 392 at page 140? Because I made, in my overview, a number of unreferenced points, which delayed me a little. Um, and, uh, I'm conscious of that. Um, 
but paragraph 392 essentially makes those points and the references in Rosa to local court proceedings and the fact that legal aid is available and so on and what it involves and the references to Resic and Rosa are all given there and it goes over the page and it actually also refers because we were seeking to identify where the, the disagreements were my lady uh, for example you mentioned wasn't there a, some evidence in relation to the president of the Supreme Court letter mm. and that's addressed at 392F and you'll see there was a, sta a statement from Mr. Soares and I have to say it's an example of why one has to treat some of these criticisms with real caution because the, Mr. Soares one Suarez, of the, surely Su Su Suarez, Suarez, Suarez so, uh, Well maybe he is English but if, he, if he's Brazilian if he's, you pronounce it Suarez Suarez Maybe it doesn't matter um, well, I've been puzzled when you said so. Oh, I, no uh, I apologise to him. Uh, the man referred to three lines up from the bottom. <laughs> uh, but he is one of PGMBM's co counsel And he, I would respectfully submit, slightly impertinently, questioned the accuracy of the president of the appeals court's letter. Uh, and Mr Justice Resick explains in his report that it uh, arose from a misunderstanding. But that's a good example of what I was referring to this morning. My lady's right. One does find across the evidence. So have we got that letter? Yes. The I, I, did, I couldn't find it except in the in except on except in the opus two in the trial bundles. It's it's. No. Do you, do you mean the letter from the? No, I meant Mr. I meant the doc, the, the document um, footnoted at uh, four one seven. Uh, and so far as it's on Opus, we can provide that in our bundle. But for qualifying for legal aid is concerned, um, is there any evidence about, I mean, there's a statement here, the vast majority will qualify. Uh, what, 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 do we have any threshold evidence? Yes, Mr. Uh, Justice Rezik um, mm. said that in his, in, his, in his statement, and it wasn't con that was not ever questioned. And he, he also said that it must follow that a large number of the 70,000 who brought proceedings must have used legal aid. Um, and there was never a suggestion from any of the, there was never a, that was not questioned either and as I said to you this morning it hasn't been suggested that any of the 70,000 had difficulty uh, obtaining legal aid or um, obtaining legal representation you're going to get that um, that document the, four, the footnote 417 document yes I appreciate we can bring it up on the screen. Do you want it on the screen? Not particularly. No. I, I think I think it's. I've touched on what it says, but I, perhaps we could move on. Yes, but there is some dispute about whether it really says what it, what you say it says. Okay. I don't mean you. <laughs> you <laughs> deliberately misrepresented it, but that there are more subtleties, and I can't remember what they are without uh, looking at it. Well, that, could I, may, may, if if. We can have it on the screen now. Could, could I come back to it and yes. I'll make, make well, it? Well, better we all when, when I come to look at the individual claims. I'm, I'm sorry to delay you further. The, 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 you're keen to emphasise that uh, about 100,000 have accepted payments from Renova. Uh, and that figure, I think, comes from Michael Five of the, the number as at early 2019, some sort of date like that. Is, yes. Has that number been updated at all since then? Isn't more up to date. No, that hasn't. The novel system has, and we've got the latest novel system figures in the joint statement. But not uh, PIM has not been updated. Yeah, and to, to be clear, the number in Michael Five, I think my lord has this, is from there, the claimants' data. Yes, it's not an over data. No, right, but. If one, if one just uses that, and that's, and I understand your point that things may have changed since then and you say the system's getting better, but just look at that at that date, which was roughly the date when these, you say, abusive proceedings were commenced. That means that about 100,000 of these claimants had not accepted payments from Renova. Now, I understand you can make points that 
some will have unrealistic claims, some may be fraudulent, and so on. But it would be quite striking, wouldn't it, if uh, uh, Renovo were objectively viewed providing adequate redress to uh, claimants when such a large proportion of the claimants here uh, have not regarded the payments that are being offered as adequate at all. Well, my Lord, it's not, if I may respectfully say so, that figure, because there's 100,000 who have accepted payments from Renova, but there are um, 54,000 who brought, or 670,000, 67,000 who brought their own proceedings. So the total number who've either brought proceedings or gone for, to Renova is in the region of 160 odd thousand. Well, so the difference between those who have. You know, might, that, the either or may not. There may be some who've done both. Then. They have. The, 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 the figures show that there are about 160, 154 to 160 who've done both. Can I. No. Can we. Can we uh, sorry, sorry, there's 154 who have done at least one. Yeah, but that is quite exactly. an important point. Yes, it is. Uh, I, but, but in any event, I just looking, as you've been looking, at the adequacy of certain aspects, um, you, you say in relation to Renova, I absolutely understand, if they don't like that, they can always sue in the local courts. Yes. But just for the moment as to whether they're going to have to do that because Renova's not satisfactory, if one takes that 100,000, Bigger. That leaves an awful lot of claimants in these proceedings who subjectively regarded Renovo as inadequate. And I have your point that it's not a subjective question, it's an objective question. But it would be pretty surprising, wouldn't it? We don't. There weren't any objective justification for any significant proportion of those regarding what Renovo was doing as inadequate. Well, my Lord, there's no evidence about that. It's just a common sense point. Well, no, is, is it? I, I, I question that, my lord. Let me put it the other way. I, 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 you, you've been showing us a great deal of evidence of how Renova is doing a great deal of good for a large number of people. And I can quite understand that that's what the public prosecutor regards should be happening. But you've also emphasised that there's a disparate group amongst claimants generally. And we've got this particular group of claimants, which is by no means all the claimants who've suffered loss of result of the dam, who've chosen to try and sue in England. And because the scheme is seeking to do the greatest good for the greatest number, and may even be achieving that, it doesn't follow that a significant proportion, at least, of the claimants who've chosen to sue here are not getting adequate. Well, and well, and the 100,000 split may just be a reflection of that. Well, That's, that begs if I may, I mean, it's a, very high a level lot point, of questions. It also questions, I mean, this is a delicate subject, and I make, I make no, no criticism at all of um, lawyer-led litigation. That is not meant to be a criticism. It is, it is a feature of litigation. Um, and, but the mere fact that a lot of people sign on a dotted line one has to treat with a lot of caution whether that necessarily leads to certain inferences. I, I, I think it's fair to say that. Yes. And we have had, and Mr. Michael put in evidence in Michael 5, a number of the public comments that have been made in Brazil that you can well understand would make litigation here seem extremely attractive. Higher damages, no cost risk, quicker. And if you're a washerwoman on the Rio Doce, one can immediately see why, and I don't mean this in any way disparagingly, one can immediately see why that is an attractive option. And I'm not just that, those are not just ex cathedra statements from me. There is evidence about that. Yeah. There is evidence of PGMBM uh, saying that the Supreme the uh, Court of Appellate Appeals in Menes Jarris is, is awarding too little. And you've seen the evidence recently that Mr. Michael in Michael 14 put in his um, statement about uh, uh, statements from PGMBM lawyers criticising Judge Mario's novel system and saying that Judge Mario is in fact seeking to assist defendants, which in my submission is an outrageous statement when one looks at his, uh, and his independence and integrity 
uh, and desire to assist the claimants had never been in question. So that's a very long answer to your Lordship's point. But I, 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 in my submission, that is relevant to an evaluation. But one keeps coming back to the fact that, and, it's, and I'm repeating to some extent what the judge said here, I'm not able on a strikeout to say that there may not be a number of people in this group who genuinely believe and legitimately believe for subjective reasons uh, that suing in England is a better route. But Which your lordship has the objective. Say legitimately believe for Sorry, le subjective reasons. For subjective reasons in that sense. Yes, that was loose language, I'm grateful. Yeah. Uh, subjectively believe, as the judge said. But I think we're all agreed the test is, a, is an objective one. And the, the reality of those um, criticizing Renova is you have my points on the fact it's ratified, it's, 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 um, which is, in my submission, very important that it is the judicial mechanism and it's under judicial supervision. But one has, in, a, in, 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 in addition to that, the famous safety valve, and that goes back to how accessible it is, and you have my submissions, and I've started to give you some references. Any claimant can go to a small claims court. Have you have that point. And, and, and I, I'm jumping ahead of myself here, but one, one then asks how, if one's looking for individual redress here, what is the only realistic way that 200,000 claims could be resolved? And the English court would no doubt think the only sensible way is a scheme. Just as the, um, just as the Brazilian institutions of justice have reasoned. All right. Have, have reasoned. Were you suggesting what the, an English court here would, would, would no doubt go ahead? Would no doubt consider that? But it wouldn't wouldn't be able to institute a scheme. It would be able to manage the litigation within the court procedures. But it wouldn't be able to impose a scheme. No. And the the, pro, the issue is there already are two schemes, and they are being managed and supervised by the Brazilian court. And the claimants want to continue have access to have I'm access. Just, to I'm them. just saying I'm not sure an English court would undoubtedly think that the only sensible way forward was a scheme. Well, if, if, if it's, if I'm, if therefore in terms of pointlessness, this is where I started in my overview. Mm -hmm. It comes down to saying the only way you're going to get an individualized assessment is if you have 200,000 individualized trials or 150,000 with some, whatever it may be, but a very, very large number of individualized trials. And one compares the position of a claimant with access now to the small claims court in Brazil with somebody coming here and I that is we keep coming back to that key point which I accept is is at the kernel of the pointlessness finding of the judge and the findings insofar as he didn't make we invite this court to make is it can I just follow up my lady's point? I have less experience in this than she does, and certainly than, than, than you do. I'm certainly aware of one or two cases of big litigation which are settled on the basis that a scheme has been set up and funded by the defendants. Um, uh, the initial case of the um, haemophiliacs who got infected blood um, were settled in that way and I'm sure there are lots of other examples but those are only achieved by settlement aren't they I'm not aware of any power in the court to impose a scheme or even to stay proceedings telling a party to go away and agree a, a scheme it's never been put to the test whether if it's unmanageable without a scheme the court will what the court can do well in, in, in my submission Two answers to that. One is I, I respectfully agree, and I've certainly had never had experience of, a, of it being imposed by a court, and I, and I would, would, would respectfully submit it, it couldn't be without, without agreement. It would have to be part of a settlement, and, and that is the only such situation in which I've ever known it to happen. But it is, it is never, there's never been a situation in which there are already two schemes being supervised by a foreign court to which the claimants wish to have access, which is why I suspect the claimants 
have never, in all the evidence that they put in, seriously suggested or put forward the fact that there should be another scheme. And one asks the question, even if there was agreement, how on earth could an English court cut across or seek to cut across in some way the schemes in operation in Brazil, where Judge Mario is seeking to bring finality, for example. He, in his most recent judgment of the 30th of October, he has closed PIM to new applications. I know. <laughs> I apologise. <laughs> We've all, all been. We've all. We've all <laughs> <laughs> not only have we all been there. We've all been there in both positions. Yes, exactly. exactly. <laughs> well, I'm sure I... neither my lord nor my lady never passed uh, the leader well, a note that he was not very keen and receptive to. I'm plodding my way, as usual, <laughs> to the key point that it is open to these claimants. So. It, you know, that's highly relevant to, in my submission to this discussion because Judge Mario is seeking. And, and has said in his Baixi Guandu judgment, people have had, as he put it, six years to sign up. He says he finds it very difficult to believe that there are still reasons why they shouldn't, but he, he says we must bring it to an end. Actually, on a serious note, um, to, are there any limitation or bars to any of the current claimants in England, the English claimants, to bringing proceedings in Brazil? Could, could I, I keep yes. saying Sorry, that's, that's a huge is, question because there'll be, there'll, be, there'll be limitations as a matter of law yes. and then any cut-off dates in the scheme. It's an issue we've addressed and could it's, I come sorry. back to that? Thank you, of course. So, um, yes, so, so Judge Mario in the Baixi Grandu judgment, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll give you the references, one of the things he, uh, sorry, in the, in the most recent Axis 7 judgment of the 30th of October is that he has said it's time for PIM to close. And he has he set a date of the 31st of December 2021 for final applicants to the PIM scheme. And he, again, meeting some of the criticisms that my lady in particular has noted, and recognizing that registration and bureaucracy had been a problem, he ordered Renova, and I summarize, to carry out registrations over the course of a, a period of sequential months. So he ordered them to speed up, and that is now the position that applies and would apply to these claimants who do have the right to access PIM. They would be subject to Judge Mario's expedited registration process. But, but you can't force them to register. You can't force them to register. So if they but, haven't registered, where are they now? What, the, 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 if, if you haven't registered and you're not a, one of these claimants... You, you, if you, you are one of the claimants in the English court. You, you, can, you can still register... Now, it's open for the English claimants. Well, there's a carve out, is there? Yes. By, by Judge by Mario. Yes. So it's open for the English claimants now. And in terms of Im improvements, my Lord or Justice Popwell is concerned with, A, the registration timing is the subject now of court orders by Judge Mario. B, he has put an independent expert, a management consultant, in to advise, act as a, a level of appeal against registration. So if people are dissatisfied with their registration process, or indeed with the Renova decision as to whether they should be registered, they have a right of appeal to an independent expert. And the third right of appeal... <laughs> You're on your own. <laughs> when you want it. <laughs> A third right of appeal to Judge Maria, and I'll check on the last point. But anyway, he has introduced an, an appeal process. So, so the where, 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 where's the evidence for this? You'll be taking us to it later. That is Ca Ca Calif, Calif one in divider in, in, in file n. Would it be helpful just to throw us to it now, or yes, would you rather yes, not? Certainly. Or is it actually to freight us? Sorry. 25. It's Callus paragraph 25, page 2925. And this is his judgment on the 30th of October. It's in Axis 7. 
He notes the broad approval for the novel system from the institutions of justice. This is a summary of his judgment. He extends the novel system to the entire area. He requires Renova to apply the scheme and allow affected persons to make a claim in the novel system until 30th of April, unless it's extended. And the view of Mr. Callop is that it probably will be, and there has been an application by a local commission for it to be extended. He expands the category of eligibility, this is the novel system we're on, to those who filed foreign lawsuits before the 30th of April, so that's all the English claimants. Um, and there are some... Um, they ruled PIM, it's seven. Yeah, and there are, but there are some other, are there some other foreign proceedings going on? Uh, no. 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 And it's 25-7, my Lord. Ruled that PIM should close on the 31st, having been open for six years, set deadline for an over to process registrations, and created a mechanism for Kearney, that's the expert, to review unsuccessful appeals. But does the, does the English claimant carve out a flight to the PIM as well as the novel? Yes. Yes. So. But does that mean the English claim is subject to the cut-off date of... Um, 30th of April for the novel system. 30th of April for novel and... and, and what 31st happened? of December for PIM. So they're late for PIM. So they're not subject to the PIM cut-off date, the 30th of, 1st of December. I'm, I'm not saying you're wrong about that, but it, he doesn't say that. No. It's uh, is it Defratus then? Right, so PIM, they've got to, to get into novel, these claimants have to get in before the 30th of April. Unless get it's extended, and Mr Callum thinks extended. it probably will, will, will do. And for the PIM, um, the, 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 it, I can give you the reference, but there's no cut-off for these claimants. They, it's, they, just it, it's the fatus 324. Please. No, it says in any event, it's page 2945, and now acting as your junior, Mr Gibson. <laughs> um, in any event, English claimants will continue to be able to claim through PIM as they have filed their claims in the UK before the 30th. Is that right? No. Yeah. Yes, that's right. So they... they, they on the basis of the date they filed their English claims, they're, they're in. It's an oddity, no doubt, for the best of reasons, that although this is new evidence before us, we have the witness statements, but we don't have the exhibit. We, I can give you the This was, in fact, the evidence before Mr Justice Turner as well. And I'll, I'll give you the references. But the evidence before Mr Justice Turner was that the PIM programme is open to the English claimants. Yes, why would it not be? Well, in, in case there, there was some deadline. some deadline was set. Um, but before Mr Justice Turner, the debate about the novel system, to some extent fueled by Professor Rosa, was whether it would take off, whether, whether because of the, the issues it in fact would go anywhere and um, as you've seen and I can give you the, the latest on that where's the joint statement it's the joint statement which is in, in the same file at 50 and it's page 2950 And the update is that this is at the top of page 2950. As at the 9th of March 2022, 118,859 claimants were entered by individuals to the novel system, <coughs> including 19,400 of the claimants. So there are nearly 20,000 of the current claimants who've applied to the novel system 
Approximately 61,000 agreements have been reached, including with nearly 9,800 of the claimants, and 51,000 have already been paid, <coughs> including 8,900 of the claimants. Renova has paid out 5 billion real through the novel system. I know figures don't necessarily mean a huge amount, but that is, I think, on any view in the time, given this is a novel system, a, a substantial sum. So the novel system has clearly, as Judge Mario has said in his judgment, been lauded by the institutions of justice in Brazil and is extremely popular and is being used. Renova has been improved. Sorry, can, just before you leave that, can, can I just make sure I've understood this? All the paperwork relating to this part of Mr. Caleb's evidence is in a single exhibit, uh, which is fine, which we haven't got. It has reference. It has references in. Or if we have, I didn't know we've got it. It has references in the side in the in those funny brackets that I don't know what the name of, which was suggested to me they're only available through Opus. But I thought when I tried to look on Opus, but I managed to find the original trial bundle, right? The, there's another bundle, is there, with all the most recent exhibits? There, there, there is, and we will ensure that. Well, I'm not sure we want hard copies of everything. I think don't give them to us unless we ask. But I am inclined to think that I would like. It's not a huge exhibit, is it? Um, no. It's about 150 pages. Um, or maybe it's not. I it don't know how big the exhibit is. Well, it, it includes Judge Mario's latest judgment. In, in translation. In translation, which is the 30th of October judgment, which rolls out the novel system and puts down the pillar. Well, I may regret having asked for this, but I think, could, could we have that? Yes. Uh, how, could we have that exhibit? Yes. Thank you. Can you make That's a note? If it assists, my lord, um, there is a specific tab um, under the heading trial bundle, which relates to the fresh evidence uh, in relation to the appeal, which includes. So it is on Opus, as I understand it. Um, but um, rather, I think here is. Yes, OK. I, I've tried to avoid using Opus because I'm rather clumsy at it. But I did use it for a little bit in my pre reading, and I didn't find these right. materials. But we, we will get the hard copy anyway. I'm just mentioning it. Yeah, OK. Yes. It is to be found under, under trial bundle. There's something called Volume H Appeal, which in fact isn't material from the trial bundle. It is. Yes, for the appeals, and it's in that. It's That's in no that. doubt why I didn't it's find it. All that. I'm afraid it's wrongly labelled. It's not. It's not in the appeal. Okay. Well, thank you. So, could I just give you a reference before leaving Ren Renova um, for the overlap between Renova programmes and the English claims? De Freitas one twenty five. <laughs> B1 stroke 5 stroke 84 to 86. Um, for reference for the actions that have been brought against Renova, De Freitas 2, that's on Opus at the moment, but I think this should be, this will be in hard copy, B2 stroke 4 stroke 7. I've taken you to the Turner skeleton to show you the nature of the expert debate in the law and uh, in relation to obligations of the TTAC. And I showed you those this morning, and I showed you the evidence supporting the practical points that led to the judge's findings in 132 and 133. But we'll put those also in, 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 in our document for the court. Could I just move quickly to um, finish? this preliminary part of my submissions um, with well, on key facts I'm on key facts yes. um, just to make it clear what's been happening in the, the 155 we addressed this briefly in our skeleton at paragraph 40 There's no need to, to turn it up it's addressed in the Turner skeleton at paragraphs 186 to 190 but just to make it clear what is the point of the expert work? 
Pursuant to Clause 96 of the GTAC, renegotiations are to take place on the basis of diagnosis and results from studies carried out by experts and the prosecutors and the companies. That approach has been ratified by the court, and, that, and the experts identified are identified at the Turner Skeleton, paragraph 188. And as I told my Lord earlier, there's LACTEC, which is an environmental expert, diagnosing the extent of socio-environmental damage caused by the dam collapse. FGV is the economic damage expert producing reports on socio-economic damage, including indemnification. And Rambol is the Renova expert reporting on Renova's programs. And the costs of those experts are paid for by the companies. Those costs have already, uh, or in the region of £65 million pounds so far. And you've heard about the negotiations. So far as the priority axes are concerned, um, the judge referred to those, and there's no need to, to turn it up, but important findings in paragraphs 123 and 131, uh, which are not challenged so far as I can see, the key points about the priority axes are summarised in our skeleton of 41 to 42, um, and there's also more about them in the Turner skeleton uh, at paragraphs 197 to 216. But there are th the, the key points are they are essentially concerned with resolving issues which have arisen in the operation of the Renova programmes. And you can see that from Rosa 2 at supplementary M432842. And the reason that that's an important point, as I said earlier, is that the claimants have complaints about Renova, and one answer is the extent to which these are being improved through the PA process. The second point is, as you've heard, Axis 7 is concerned expressly with Renova's indemnification programme. Mr Vivan in Vivan 2 at 281 supplementary stroke M stroke 41 stroke 2744 describes that. And he says, Axis 7 is concerned with making improvements to Renova's indemnification programme and how it should be implemented. And Rosa is in substantial agreement with this. And at paragraph 31 of Rosa 2, he identifies some points of disagreement. But just to give you the reference at um, Rosa 2, paragraph 31, supplementary stroke M, stroke 43, 2851. He says, PA7 appears to envisage future decisions about whether Renova's extrajudicial registration programme should be closed, and if the issues are reached, how Renova's mediation scheme operates, and whether the damages matrix might be amended. The best reference for damages and causation issues is Vivan 2 at 252 to 278, supplementary M stroke 41 stroke 2736. So the key points I rely on in respect of the priority axes are, 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 not, are not in dispute. Um, the fact that the, legis the legitimacy uh, has been questioned hasn't prevented the expert work carrying on and Judge Mario carrying on um, using the priority axis to uh, progress the 155 uh, and the Renova programmes. One then comes to the local commission proceedings, and they are described, and I took you to this earlier, at Turner Skeleton 207 to 216, and we deal with them very briefly in our skeleton at 47, and the judge deals with them and refers to rough justice at paragraph 123. Uh, as I've said, the background to them is set out in the Turner skeleton at 207 to 210, and essentially they are indemnification programmes brought by local commissions in the 12th Federal Court, seeking indemnification on behalf of affected people in their localities. And one of the reasons that the judge praised Judge Mario's uh, expedition is that the first claim in the Baichu, Baichu Guandu was filed on the 4th of May 2020. Judge Mario handed down his big judgment that you've seen, examining all of the individual claims and setting up the rough justice on the 1st of July 2020. 
and since then 72 local commission claims have been lodged there are 72 and covering the entire area which applies to the claimants and Judge Mario has already handed down 35 judgments and the key points about the novel system are not disputed first we summarise these at our skeleton at paragraph 42 it's a judicial compensation scheme which the 12th Federal Court ordered Renova to establish in response to concerns principally about delay and issues of proof relating to PIM. Sorry, did you, did you say that the 72 local commission claims cover all the areas in which the claimants in these proceedings all ex I, I, All except, for, I think it would be a tiny part, I apologise, my lord, I... Um, it's it's Calif, isn't it? I'm sorry. The, the, the novel system covers up the area. The local commission, I think the evidence was 99, 96. I'll get the exact figure. It was 90-something percent. Apologies, that was loose. Um, so on the key points of the novel system... This is our skeleton at paragraph 42, uh, core stroke A, stroke 6 at 138. It's a judicial compensation scheme which the 12th Federal Court ordered Renova to establish in response to concerns, principally of delay and issues of proof relating to PIM. Ah, here we are. The scheme was in mid-2020 in its infancy, but as the judge noted, my Lord, Lord Justice Popwell, 96% of the claimants... Uh, fell within areas covered by the local commissions, meaning they could all bring or benefit from similar proceedings. Two, the scheme operates like PIM by a damages matrix. Categories of individuals are entitled to judicially set compensation in respect of their loss caused by the dam collapse. The formal requirements of proof under Brazilian law do not apply, and this is important given the likelihood remarked on by the judge that many claimants will or may lack the ability formally to prove loss and affected persons who make use of a novel system must sign a release. The debate in relation to local commission proceedings and the novel system arose primarily out of how to characterise the local commission claims and Professor Rose's suggestion that local commissions did not have standing and that therefore the system might not expand. Well, we respectfully submit Characterization is, is not uh, relevant uh, to the question of whether they provide a route to redress. And the fact is, at the time, although the claimants through Professor Rosa were questioning the future and expansion, there were already eight local commission proceedings and two decisions when we appeared before Mr Justice Turner. And I've explained to you a moment ago that there are now 72 local commission proceedings claims with 35 judgments. And that brings us, and I think it's necessary just to look at it briefly, because I know you've already been to the Baishu Guandu decision. And may I commend to you, given the length of that decision, because it does quote Appendix 4 to um, the, Turner, the Turner skeleton. That is, I don't know if you, you've discovered it yet, but it, perhaps if, before we go there, because it may, may help, um, file C, divider 5, which is the Turner skeleton, the first document at divider 5 is a route map to the TTAC. I'm not present to go to it now, but it's quite useful because it does just pull out from a very long document the key, the key paragraphs that the parties rely on. And then at divider six is a route map to the GTAC, which again, you know how long that document is, and that has the key paragraphs over the course of a few pages, or some of the key paragraphs. And then we come to the document that I'd just like to take you to, which is the route map to the Baishu Guandu decision. And this contains some summary 
there's never, it hasn't been suggested that it's not fair summary, but where, where material it contains the relevant quotes from the decision. And in the light of some of the discussion, it's possibly just worth noting, because it it's, it's, it's perhaps a tiny bit more digestible in this form, um, I entirely accept that Judge Mario makes criticisms. He then deals with closure of registration. And at the top of 225, you'll see quoting from his judgment, it is unreasonable that registration remain open indefinitely. And at this stage, he was talking about, he talks about the fact that registration has remained open for, for some time and his concern about that. As I've said, in his latest that's registration for PIM. In his latest um, uh, Axis 7 judgment of the 30th of October, he did actually bring down uh, the curtain on registration in the way that I've described. But he's now just talking about the Baishu Guandu local commission claim. And what he does, first of all, in at the bottom of paragraph, page 225, is he identifies the territorial scope of this decision. And you can treat this as a sample for the 72 claims that have been made. And then this is what I've been quoting from in my submissions to you at the top of page 226. He, he sets out here what the affected parties can choose from, as he puts it. This is page 1058 of the, of the judgment. A mediated indemnity programme, the PIN programme, which correctly exists following the procedural rules, eligibility criteria, indemnification parameters following applied by PIM Foundation. Then he says, apply, uh, filing of the individual action with the local courts under the terms of procedural law, aiming at the specific and individualized proof of damage with the corresponding procedural costs. Or the third one, the new indemnity system, simplified and flexible based on the notion of, 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 of rough justice. He then says how you can become eligible, and, he's, and, and as you can see here, he sets out here what you have to do to prove presence in Baishu Guandu. And for, for the purposes of this... Sorry, for the pur this is for the purpose of his new system? or Of his new system. For the purposes of proving presence, residence in the territory during the period of the harmful event, the affected parties must use one of the following means. And he sets out the list of documents which you would prove you would you produce to prove that you were in the relevant area. And then he delimits the, the area of scope by reference to the flood line, the medium ordinary flood line, the LMEO, deprivation of access to animal protein obtained from the Rio Dochi. This issue concerns the definition of the area in which he's ready to assume that residents depend on fish produced by the river. And he calls that the LMEO, and that's a term he uses in, in all of the different claims that he's adjudicated. And then he goes to the, to the damages matrix, and he considers, first of all, the legal grounds for it, and he refers to the social purposes and the requirements of the common good when applying the law. And then having identified the legal grounds, he turns to, at the top of page 227, page 1069 of the judgment, the theoretical grounds. And he says that paragraph two, strictly speaking, the claim for indemnification is governed by the provisions of the civil code. And he gives an example. And he says he identifies three problems with the system in a case like this where a disaster had directly or indirectly more than uh, affected more than 500,000 affected parties through the extension ex exceeding 700 kilometres. He says, at first, it should be advised that the judiciary branch would not have the conditions to prosecute hundreds of thousands of individual actions in a timely manner, not to mention the obvious risk of contradictory and unequal decisions leading to distrust of the system. Second, the classical solution provided for in the civil law system on many occasions does not take into account the reality of the place. Within the scope of the Rio Dochi, there is an extremely simple and at times socially vulnerable region. The reality shows that the majority of the victims, affected parties, do not have the adequate means to prove many of the damages that not only they, but surely, sorry, that they not only allegedly, but surely experience. 
The situation of informality is so prevalent in the watershed that many affected parties cannot even prove the alleged profession or even their home address. And third, we may see that the judiciary in doing so fails to resolve the conflict, let alone lead to some kind of social pacification. So against that background, he says what's needed here is a new approach to indemnification, and that's page 1070 of his judgment. He then explains at the top of the next page, at seven, the rough justice system, and says that it concerns the use of a simplified process to deal in a pragmatic way with mass indemnity issues, in which it's practically impossible to demand that each victim present the material and individual evidence of their damages in court. And he explains it further, and he basically says three lines up from the bottom. The obvious conclusion, and this is, of course, the judge in charge of this action, is that by acting according to the classical procedural conception does not deliver an adequate relief as it fails to promote the necessary social pacification. So he borrows the term rough justice from American law. And then, he take, then we take as the first example washerwomen. He so recognizes them as... I've, I've, I've got lost. I'm sorry, that's at the bottom. I've read this in the original, but... Which page are we on, sorry? Uh, so sorry, the bottom of page 228. Oh, yes, got it now, yes, thank you. Um, it's page 1072 yep. of the original. And he recognizes washerwomen as an affected category. He, he says that in order to prove the activities in the territory at the time of the harmful event, plaintiffs must prove their presence in the territory in October, November, or December. So that's all you have to do. And he then sets out how you do it at the three at the top of 229. And then he, at indemnification amount, he considers that the submissions by the parties on how long the relevant period of interruption should be. And he says, as you can see, the question of water quality in the Rio Dochi is sub judice within the scope of priority axes six and nine, both aimed at carrying out expert technical evidence to resolve definitively the existing doubts. That was what I was referring to earlier when I said the priority axes are sub judice. Um, he then, there is then debate and submission about how long the period should be. He then makes the point that washerwomen at D, 4D, who have adequate documentation capable of proving their right, may, if they consider themselves pertinent, file their own lawsuit. But he then, for the purposes of his system, identifies an average indemnity amount at E. And based on, as he says, as to the period of interruption at F at the bottom, it is known that until the present date, the washerwomen are unable to exercise their profession. That's over the page 230. Either due to the general perception that the water from the Rio Doce remains inappropriate, so he's basing it on a general perception, or due to the absence of an official technical report in the judicial system attesting to the quality of the water. He said the judicial expert investigations of quality is expected at least another 15 months. He therefore said the period of interruption should be 56 months, a period from the collapse to now plus 15 months, and he additionally awarded 10,000 moral damages. And he did that same exercise for all of those you see listed on page 30, and he's done it in 35 at the, in, the, in the second box. Artisans, sand miners, subsistence fishermen, and so on. Um, associations in general, farmers, rural producers, and so on. And the, the various categories. These are the Baishiguandu by Shiguandu categories, but there will be similar categories and indeed expanded categories in the 72. He then says, and this is 1226 of the judgment, second box on page 231, need for the creation of own flow online platform to comply. He says, Renova must make an online platform available by the 1st of August on which affected people can claim in accordance with the matrix set up. And he says, then mandatory attendance of a lawyer, and this goes to, to some of the points that have been expressed, in favour of the affected parties at the adhesion phase. That's the settlements phase. Judge Mario held the affected people need to be represented by a lawyer, sorry, that only lawyers can access the platform. So, and... So adhe adhesion is, is settlement, is it? Yes. 
but in fact only lawyers can access the platform, so lawyers do the accessing. So we have some indication of the availability of lawyers because 120,000 have accessed the platform since this started. Um, he then says determination for the deadline for this particular platform, it was open till the 31st of October 2020, but that's been extended by him as, along with all of them to the 30th of April. And then you have the section we looked at yesterday in relation to uh, settlement, and I have a reference for you to show you what the actual settlement agreements look like. And there's also a Mario, uh, any ratification, any, any settlement is ratified by Judge Mario. And the release reference is at H5 stroke 4, Hooper's reference. And you can go to it now. If you, if you well, can't. We can't, unless we act as own. Well, no, if, you, if you want to ask, I don't. Uh, I don't need. No, but this I, we did ask for this yesterday to have it in hard copy. Ah, oh, yes. And that be got on with. My apologies. That that's being put together. It will be in the Caliph exhibit. This will be in the exhibit to the Caliph thing. Yes, I think I saw it. Too. And there's also the ratification judgment at H five stroke five. So, I may interrupt briefly. Apparently, in bundle O, tab 56, settlement, uh, sample settlement. Shall we look at it quickly now? If you, yeah, I don't want to interrupt your flow, and I'm finding this a helpful exercise, but. Yes, I see. Thank you. Thank you. The relevant bit is at H5, stroke 4, stroke 5. The release is set yeah, out. Yes, so that's four pages in. Um, it's the first two bullet points, I'm told. I hereby grant run over the widest, complete, irrevocable. And the release granted here and extends to and includes without limitation some marker shareholders, any subsidiary. Doesn't, it, uh, doesn't include... Uh, yes, I see. Any yes. company, yes. national or foreign, directly or indirectly related. Yes. And their insurers. So is that page 3204, was it in hard copy? 3203. Second bullet point on 3203. So, um... That. I, it's quite interesting to see. I, I don't want to yeah, waste sorry. time, but I mean, it has very much as you would expect to see here, though, to be even wordier than we are. A the 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 lawyer has to has to um, uh, certify that they've given full advice. Yes. Yes. So, just two two more bits of this to show you. On page two three two, you have. The point that I made earlier today is on 1231 of the judgment. He says he describes the action in the first paragraph that is quoted there as a. I'm so second. sorry, I, I just didn't catch up. Where, where have you gone? Sorry, my lord, we're on page 232, yep. second box headed loss of suit fees. Yep. And he first of all clarifies that this proceeding. Despite having been prepared as an enforcement of judgment, he described it as a typical ordinary action. So I'm not sure. So that's how he's describing it. He then says, and this is the point I referred you to earlier, the obligation to redress the damages, full redress, has already been recognised and consolidated at the phase of cognizance of the main civil actions that this recognition was given in broad terms, thus demanding a new judicial intervention in the definition of affected and eligible categories. So he's, <laughs> he's saying... So, and then finally, he says that the... He grants an injunction, injuncting Iranova at the bottom of page 232, as of the 1st of August 2020, on which the online platform must be made available. Uh, That's in the final quote at the bottom of the... Let me just read it. Yes, 
Yes, I see. Yeah. Just before you put it away, I'm so sorry. Could well, I it's, slightly, it's slightly odd. Does that simply mean set up the, the process? The final phrase, with the resulting payment after the judicial homologation of those eligible, what does that mean? That means that he will ratify, I think. Homologation. homologation is ratification. Yes, I know, but what's the resulting payment referred to? Renova, I'm told, has to pay within 10 days of... The pay what? The, the, the sum ag agreed. Renova makes the offer. But nothing has been agreed. The... I see. So, if you go online, this is, this is what this means, you are basically signing up to all the payments under the, matrice, ma under the relevant matrices. There still has to be a process, presumably, to see that you... which boxes you tick. Yes, that's why you, you, you have a lawyer who, who, who puts in the relevant information to and that, say that you And that, that then comes out with a sum. And then run over. And then it goes to Judge Mario to be approved. And then Renova have to pay. Do we say Renova has to pay? Well, Renova, Renova are one of the pay. parties that has to see that, that, that agree that it will be, that are ordered to see that it will be paid. But as long as one of them does, it doesn't really matter who. It's, it's Renova. It, 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 it is Renova that pays. Where does it say that? It goes to H5 slash 5. It's at H5 slash 5. The, um, is that the settlement agreement? That's the, no, oh, that's I the see. ratification. The ratification judgment. judgment. We haven't got that, have we? It's on it. Okay. Well, thank you. So, yes, it's payment within 10 days of ratification. And if the individual is not satisfied with the offer, you can appeal to a different team within Renova. Where are you reading this from now? Uh, a note. <laughs> uh, I'll have to check where it, it may. I, I, I'll have to check where it is. You said actually. before you can appeal to somebody in the team, and if that's not happy, then you can go to Mario. You know, this. Well, you, you, you then appeal to an expert, Kearney. Ah. If Kearney overturns Renova's decision and the individual accepts this, Renova can pay the amount, and if that, if, if, if the still uh, dissatisfaction, um, they can appeal to the 12th Federal Federal Court. Right. So, just to point one, one point. Well, I think I can say without being, uh, being in any way partisan, and obviously I must check the um, subject that Mr. Chu Chow may say, I, I found that a very helpful document. Um, Thank you. Because I have tried to read Judge Mario, and yeah. I think I've spotted the first points, but this gives the structure in a yes. helpful way. So Thank you. Okay to somebody. My lord, um, my lady, just at page 226 of the document, uh, I rightly just asked her to point out in relation to the fact that the issue concerns redress, uh, solely redress, where Judge Ma uh, when you go to court, when Judge Mario in the top box of page 226 is referring to individual actions, he himself says, filing of the individual action with the local courts under the terms of procedural law and STJ case law, that's the Supreme Court, aiming at the specific and individualised proof of damage. So he's, it's certainly his clear uh, understanding that that is what the individual proceedings involve. It's a quantum trial. So that is the priority axes and local commission claims. So far as developments in the 155 since the judgment, as you've heard, negotiations remain very active. And as you've seen, and forgive me if I don't go to it now, but it's Calif 1. Uh, they're being conducted on the basis of full, full redress. Sorry, can I just ask one more thing about local commission claims? My understanding up to this point is the local commission claims are claims to to get improvements in the system. Uh, and that is what happened in this particular case with the Bayou Grandes, was a, Bayou Grandes, you know what I mean, uh, was a, uh, was just such a claim. And no, no, Lord, they are, they are 
collective I, I, I see the collective liquidation claims the local commissions are making collective claims I see. for compensation as we in fact they're doing both aren't they because they, they may be doing it, that but, but, but that, it was also their litigation so to speak which produced yes indeed new scheme. Yep. okay yeah, that's all for some people it may mean they're better off under the rough justice system it still may mean a number of people may could still prefer to go to PIM and prove all of their loss but certainly in these local commission claims the local commissions will have spoken to local people identified what losses they considered they'd suffered, make a claim for those losses as best they can, make representations about how long the period of extension should be, and they vary. And then on the basis of those claims, um, Judge Mario has drawn up a, a, a matrix for each local commission, uh, de depending on the nature of the claims. But the matrices have developed over the course of the last year. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but, you, but don't you still have to have registration. The individuals who are within the areas of local commission they, they, not, they have to not register. themselves bound, as it were. No, you, you, they register. They then register. Yes. So it's, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a framework under which the individual claimants are able to yes. make, make their, make their claims, claims, for, their the justice, claims for the rough justice amount. Yes. So... Since, since the judgment, as I say, the negotiations have been very active. All relevant stakeholders to the GTAC are involved. Um, the public prosecutor, the public defenders, the state, the governors, and, and they're being conducted at the highest level. In, this is in the evidence from... Yes, uh, Calif 1. Calif that's you. all. That's fine. Thank you. And it's under the auspices of the National Ch um, Justice Council, which is chaired by the President of the Supreme Court of Brazil. Uh, the, of the Constitutional Court, which is the highest court of Brazil. It's Calif... It's N somewhere. Yes, yeah. it's N48. Yeah. It's N2921, page 2921, paragraph 13. And it makes the point there that it's under, as I say, the auspices of the CNJ, the president of which is the head of the Constitutional Court of Brazil. It's all the parties to the GTAC. A letter of premises sets out, as, and, and my lord, I think, has, has looked at it, the, um, the themes. It's, it's, it's Negotiations, as he says in 14, are concerned with how to improve and accelerate the redress provided by the Renova, including compensation to affected persons. So, again, it's, an, it's another medium through which any systemic issues with compensation is being progressed at the highest level. Um, there are regular meetings, and some of the details of those meetings are put there, it's anticipated that they'll come to a head in mid-2022, this year, later this year, the summer of this year. And then that's the first topic, and then the second topic is developments in the 155, and this is what I referred to earlier. The experts have continued their work, this is paragraph 20, LACTEC, the environmental expert, has produced its final report. FGV, the socio-economic expert, and Rambol, the expert considering Renova's programmes, have all produced a number of interim and thematic reports. And Judge Mario has engaged a number of judicial experts, all paid for by the companies, who assist him in the resolution of the technical issues of the axes. And he's appointed ICOM, monitoring watering quality. And he's also appointed Kearney in priority axis 7, dealing with the registration indemnification to monitor Renova's registration of impacted persons and uh, as I explained to you he set a timetable for the registration process Did I hear you say somewhere that 65 million pounds, dollars reals, have pounds. Already, pounds have already been spent on the costs of these experts Yes right. where, where, where did, Where's that figure come from? It's, I'll give you the reference my lord, it's okay. Vivan 2 Um 
It's two paragraph two. Two seven two of Vivan one. Two seven two of Vivan one. I twenty. I twenty nine. One five two zero. So that then, at two nine two four, he updates on the priority axes. Two new axes have been opened. Axis twelve, which relates to fishing in the Rio Doce. Axis thirteen. Um, is in response to a request by an entity called SIF, one of the independent bodies that supervises Renova, who seek changes to Renova's structure and governance. And Kearney's uh, delivered a report in relation to that. And then he deals with the novel system and the updates in relation to that. And that's at the top of page 24 is where you get the 72 local commissions have brought similar claims and he's handed down judgments. I said 35, I'm sorry, it's 39 of those claims. And then you get paragraph 25, which I took you to. So the negotiations are active. The experts have been progressing their work. The novel system has become incredibly popular and successful. And the priority axes continue to enable Judge Mario to progress causation and damage issues. Sorry, you're, you're quite right to try to strike fast, but he, um, he d does he explain wh wh where is the paragraph where he actually says as at whatever date he's able to say how many people have received payments that, that is to f under under the novel system. That's to Freitas, I think. Uh, if you could go to page, the page which is the next one. Yeah, it's it's actually out of date now. It's paragraph twenty eight of De Freitas at page two nine four five at the bottom. At the, at, as at the third of December twenty twenty one, the figure was a hundred thousand. Sorry. Um, hang on one second. Yes, I see, yeah. And that's been updated in the joint statement and is now another 20,000, I think, roughly. Have, and that's paragraph 14B of the joint statement. At page 2950 of the same bundle. And the figure for English claimants hasn't been updated, but... Thank you. So, Sorry, so I'm just telling me that so as at first third of December twenty twenty one, yes, fifty one thousand agreements reached in the novel system. Uh, and as at March twenty two, sixty one and a half thousand. Yep. Okay. My lords, my lady, could I move on to deal more briefly than I anticipated <coughs> with the. Sorry, my lord. No, I was just. Uh, didn't mean to say anything. But I was really wry at your, at your observation. You were having to be briefer than you expected. <laughs> Another way of saying all this has taken longer than you thought. No, no, no. In fact, that, in fact, that was not was was entirely born of the fact that there's been greater agreement than I anticipated in relation to the relevant legal principle point that I started with this morning. Oh, there right, really well, doesn't seem to be a huge amount between us on the on the law. I'd respectfully submit. Um, so. Uh, There were just two points from the general principles we summarise in our skeleton at 64 to 65 to 74, which are, it will be familiar to you and are taken from Hunter and Johnson. Uh, the passage is there cited. And the first is the point that is well known, that the circumstances <laughs> in which an abuse of the process may be established are not fixed but are very varied. 
the court should adopt a flexible approach and not mechanically apply a single test. And second, Lord Bingham in, in Johnson, in, in that passage in his, his judgment, at page 31, C to D. Sorry, the, the, the first passage is uh, from Hunter is at page 536, C to D. The passage from Johnson is at page 31, C to D. And it's a, a well-known statement that there's an, a question whether there's an abuse of process in a particular case requires a broad merits-based judgment which takes account of public and private interests involved and also takes account of all the facts of the case. And the judge referred to these principles um, in, in that the section of his judgment, which you've already been taken to. But the category of, of abuse which we rely on, as, as, as you know, um, is referred to by the shorthand uh, pointless and wasteful litigation. In my submission, there are a number of policy rationales at play here. The first is it brings the administration of justice into disrepute to permit the continuation of litigation that is pointless and wasteful. Second, the court's resources should not be occupied with such litigation, which also prejudices other court users and the public more widely. And thirdly, it's unfair to burden defendants with litigation which, on an objective analysis, is pointless and wasteful. Now, we, we summarise the relevant principles in our skeleton of paragraph 66 to 74. And the court will be aware, first of all, of the test, which was first coined perhaps by Mr. Justice Eadie in Schellenberg at page 319. And that was the... Sorry, that's it, page 319 of the judgment. Of the judgment, yes, right. it's not paragraph. Mm -hmm. And that is, the court must ask whether there's any realistic prospect of a trial yielding any tangible or legitimate advantage, such as to outweigh the disadvantages for the parties in terms of expense and the wider public in terms of court resources. And that test has been approved by the Court of Appeal in Jamil, and I don't think it's necessary for me to, to go to it, but uh, as you know from our skeleton, um, we respectfully draw your attention to the quotation from Jamil that the judge referred to in his judgment at paragraph 54 of Jamil, an abuse of process is of concern not merely to the parties but to the court. It is no longer the role of the court simply to provide a level playing field and to referee whatever game the parties choose to play on it. The court is concerned to see that judicial and court resources are appropriately and proportionately used in accordance with the requirements of justice. And Lord Phillips in paragraph 55 also refers to these civil procedure rules and the fact that they require a stricter and more interventionist approach to combating potentially wasteful um, litigation, and he refers to the Schellenberg test in paragraph 57. And you will recall from the case that from paragraph 60, one sees the court carrying out that objective exercise. The claimant had two reasons for bringing the proceedings, first to obtain vindication and the second to obtain an injunction, and the court considered them and concluded it would not be proportionate to continue for either of those um, purposes. And that's in that context that uh, at 69, for example, Lord Phillips said, if the claimant succeeds in this action and is awarded a small amount of damages, it can be perhaps said that he will have achieved vindication for the damage done, but both the damage and the vindication will be minimal. The cost of the exercise will have been out of all proportion to what has been achieved. Uh, so we rely on that principle as articulated in Jamil. And there's no real dispute now that what that therefore requires is an objective inquiry. What claimants may want has to be subject to objective scrutiny uh, and doesn't trump the court's interest or the public interest in ensuring that public judicial resources are used proportionately. I, I'm not sure I, I, I agree um, about the objective nature of the inquiry, but I'm not sure that it's to the exclusion necessarily of subjective factors once you've crossed an objective threshold. Um, so I just want to put a marker down, and I'm not clear in my own mind at the moment that that objective inquiry means that no, there isn't a subjective element in the exercise as well. I don't know whether you accept that, and I haven't put it very well. Um, but I think that if you had on an objective basis um, good reason um, for pursuing proceedings, 
the fact that there were additional different layers of subjective considerations, um, that, that might be relevant as well. It wouldn't be uh, subjective by itself, not enough, but if objectively made out, there might be room for subjective um, factors to come in as well. I don't know whether you'd accept that. You, you say it's purely objective? Yes, I do. Right, okay. I do say it's purely objective. Okay. Um, and I'm just making I, it, I, I appreciate I'm not sure I accept su that. Subjective factors will be subjective, subjected to an objective inquiry. Subjective mm -hmm. reasons may be given, which on objective inquiry are considered to be legitimate and reasonable. But it's the objective nature of the inquiry that, in my submission, matters, because otherwise pointless and wasteful litigation um, will, will, will never be struck out, because a claimant will always say, I no. have very strong good No, I'm sort of it's accepting there's an objective threshold. But once you've got over that threshold, whether there is scope for subjective elements to come in as well, or be can taken into the mix, into the broad merits-based mix as well, is something I'm just... Um, considering, so I just wanted to be open with you about that. Yes. Um, so you had the, the opportunity to say, in your position is no, subjective, yes, insofar as they need to be objectively assessed, but you say that it isn't exclusively objective. I, I say it is exclusively objective. Right. I'll consider your ladyship's point further. I haven't put it very well, but I just wanted to. Thank you, that's very it. helpful. Um, uh, we then see those principles essentially. Uh, same principles being applied really in the group context and that is the A.B. and Wyeth case number four which you know and which the judge referred to in paragraph 63 of his judgment and I, I don't think it's necessary to turn it up but I take four propositions uh, from it hang on one second Yeah. Uh, first, the court expressly rejects the argument that it's not permitted to strike out a group claim, the rem remnants of a group claim, raising a viable cause of action on the grounds that it would be disproportionate to litigate it, given the minimal benefit to be obtained. And you see that from Lord Justice Stuart Smith's judgment over pages 130. Well, I think, I'm afraid I do want to have it open while you make the decisions. Oh, where, where, remind me where it is. It's at A1, A stroke 1, page 9. It's, it's, it's page so A for A, B rather than yeah. W for Y. Uh, authorities bundle A, sorry. Yep. So it is in A, yes. Apologies for that. No, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't, it doesn't. And it's, it's one of those reports where there aren't paragraphs, so one can just give the page 113, final paragraph, he records Mr Scrivener's main submission. And then second paragraph, page 114, he says, we do not agree with Mr Scrivener's submission. And then he refers to Ashmore, halfway down page 114. And in the final sentence of the first paragraph on page 115, he says, it is the effect on the courts themselves and the defendant that is important. So the first point is that he rejects the argument that was made that the court sh could not strike out a viable group of claims on that, uh, on, on a, essentially a cost-benefit exercise of viability appraisal. Secondly, the court formed its own view on the benefits and the costs of litigating the claims against the prescribers. And one sees that from the, the reasoning on page 116. Lord Justice Stuart Smith essentially conducts the analysis and, is essentially a, and, and, and says at a glance you can see that the prescriber defendants will be put to astronomical expense. To what end? The plaintiff stood to, to retain a substantial benefit. The position might well be different, but here the benefit is ex at best extremely modest, and in all probability nothing. That involves great injustice to the defendants. So he's doing this in the context of group litigation, but it's 
it's obviously since been, or the same principles are essentially being applied in Schellenberg and Jamil. The third proposition in assessing whether a pursuit of a claim would serve a useful purpose, the court is entitled to take account of relief that may be obtained from other parties and the consequences of litigation against other parties, in this case the manufacturers, and that's accepted by the claimants in their skeleton at paragraph 117C, and did by my learned friend on Monday. And fourthly, the court is entitled to take account of the difficulties faced in litigating groups of claims. Um, and you see the way he, Lord Justice Stuart Smith approached that in page 116, final paragraph, where he was addressing a submission as to whether the judge was entitled to take a broad view of the difficulties the claimants would face. And he says, uh, uh, starting at page 117, we accept Mr Scrivener's submission that the judge did not take these matters into account in reaching his decision. He did not need to because there was ample other material which he could act, but in our judgment he would have been entitled to take them into consideration had he wished to. This would not involve considering the merits of each individual case. That would have been quite inappropriate. But any judge experienced in this type of litigation, and especially in Ke Mr Justice Ian Kennedy, with his knowledge of these cases, would be able to appreciate that these considerations may present real problems if many, if not all the cases, quite apart from the modest quantum of the claims. So what he was essentially saying there, that on the strikeout application, the judge was entitled to take a broad view of the sort of merits difficulties the claimants would face. Uh, I, I think in another case, uh, A, B, and Wyeth number five, it's, it's, it's described as similar to the view that the court is permitted to take under section 33 of the... Uh, well, no, it's this very case, isn't it? Just a, is it? a sentence too, too further on. Oh, right, it? yes. It's similar to that exercise that the court is entitled to do under carry out under section 33 of the Limitation Act. But just, just to be clear, my Lord, Lord Justice Popperwell, I, 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 do, I do also, as it were, accept the challenge in relation to each individual case. I'll come back to your Lordship's point. But I, as I tried to stress when making my submissions this morning, um, leaving aside for the moment the issue with the 13, the points I make apply would apply to each individual case. This is a completely different situation and point. Points. Sorry, Melinda. I think this is a completely different situation and point being made at 117. To the one that my Lord, Lord my Lord Popperwell is making. Is simply that, um, well, is this what is this the bit you rely on for what, what you say the global approach taken by the judge? It's one of the passages I rely on. Right. I mean, the, the judge didn't only take a global approach. He, he he did look at the problems faced by the individual plaintiffs when he talked about the denial of liability in one three two and one three three, and the IRDRs. He what he was considering their individual position, as, as, as I'll seek to show you when we look at the judgment. But I also do say that it is open to a court to adopt a group basis, a group in, in a, uh, to, to, to adopt a group approach. It, it'll vary from so case to case. So what do you mean case. by adopt a group approach? Well, one could form a, a view, just as in this case, of if if, if it were relevant as to the difficulties that members of the group may, may face. Yes, but that means that every member of the group yes. may face. Yes, but you then don't necessarily... It's not really a group approach. Well, it's just looking at... It's, yes, I, I, I see your point, my lord. It means you haven't got particulars of every single case. Yes, but what he isn't saying, what I thought you were saying, and I suspect my lord thought you were saying, because it's a rather more surprising proposition, is that if you have 100 people who are maybe said to have some common characteristic, and 90 of them, uh, their claim is abusive, you can chuck out the other 10 as well, even though theirs isn't, because of the common characteristic that they share. That seems, would be a very surprising proposition, yeah, right. and doesn't seem that. to be what is being said it's, here. It's not my position in this case, because no. my position is that they are all abusive, but... Um, but is, 
would it be your fallback position? And if so, how would you defend it from a comparison with Wyeth? I don't at the moment see anything in Wyeth that says that. Well, the, the, the court in, in Wyeth is taking, looking at the cases that were seeking to continue. There were 32 cases, I think, that were seeking to bring these claims. And the court looked at them generically and the problems they faced generically. But your Lordship is right. They all faced different variations of the same problem. Yes, they were saying in all of these cases, yes. um, there is no prospect or no real prospect of, a, of any recovery or at least any more than a very modest recovery. Yes. So it's not really a group approach. In, it, 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 obviously, when you've got 32 people, you needn't look at each of the 32 if their position is broadly the same. But in principle, you're looking at each of the 32. And that's, I think, all that was being done here. Yes. Well, I, I needn't go to the mat on it, because the points I'm making do apply to all of the claimants, subject to my Lord's yes. point, which I'll come to. But um, Now, I see the time. If you want to say anything more about Wyeth, let's do it while we've got open. But otherwise... No, I don't. Save to note, and we, we, we give the reference in our skeleton to... Um, two other group cases, the Wyeth number five and the organophosphate litigation, again in which the court struck out group actions on the basis of lack of viability. Um, yeah. I this, this, was the be this was the benzos, wasn't it, Wyeth, be which eventually collapsed because the load. Yes. So... Well, my lord, I, I, I'll, I'll pause there then. I, I need to. We're part of the way through the law, so I'll be moving. We're, uh, we're, mo we're meeting again on, uh, on tomorrow afternoon. On this. We are. Um, uh, my lady has just passed me a note, um, very um, uh, generously saying that um, she could do 145 tomorrow if an extra quarter an hour would make a difference. Well, that's very kind. It, it may well. Thank you. I'm grateful. I haven't asked but you, my lord, to deal with that. Yep. Well, in that Thank case, that. we will um, meet again tomorrow at 1.45. Thank you very much. All right.